Hello there. My name is Nathaniel Wayne, uh, also known as Vera Wild. I'm the author of Dreams of Fire and the host of the Council of Geeks YouTube channel. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented creator. She's, of course, the host of Council of Geeks and a fantasy author, first time fantasy author, I do recall, with her creation of Dreams of Fire. We are joined today by the ever talented Nathaniel Wayne. How are you doing today? I'm doing just fine. Technology issues aside briefly there, uh, you know, I, I happened upon your show at Council of Geeks, uh, and I love that you have a wonderful take on the geek culture. I love the fact that you really dive into the minutia of what makes us geeks and what, what makes us passionate about what we love. But I do have to ask before we talk about your book, what is your take on the newest change in Doctor Who? And, and why do you think it's relevant today? Okay, well, I'll... I'm going to give my short version because I did a 20 minute video on this uh, over, over on the Council of Geeks YouTube channel. Short version is I was very surprised at Russell T. Davies. Uh, and for context, in case anyone isn't a Doctor Who fan, this was the person who brought Doctor Who back in 2005, ran the show for four full seasons and then a bunch of specials and then left. And we've had two showrunners since then. And him coming back was very much a shock. And I am mixed on it because I am always nervous about any property that feels like it's trying to recapture its glory days because that I feel like creatively can be where you get into the kinds of stuff that kind of bounced me off comic books years ago, where it's like, no matter what happens, it's always just going to try and roll back, whether it's literally retconning or just trying to make it feel like it used to, instead of moving things forward. And one of the things I like about Doctor Who is it's feels like it's custom built to always move forward and always try and do new things on general principle. I'm kind of like, eh, I'm less nervous specifically because it's him, because I really do feel like he's grown and changed a lot as a creative person and as a writer in the years since he left Doctor Who, looking at his output on things like Years and Years and It's a Sin. I'm less nervous about it than I would be under any other circumstances just because it's him. But just that general sort of philosophy in terms of managing the IP does make me nervous. So, of course, being the geek that you are, and now being a first-time fantasy author, why did you want to create... Well, first off, tell us what Dreams of Fire is about, and then I'll ask, why did you want to create this story? Dreams of Fire is, I, I guess, best described as kind of an adventure fantasy novel. It's a high fantasy, so it takes place in a completely uh, made-up world. And it follows a young man named Ferris, who is what is known um, within this world as an elemental. What that means is... He has these magical and powerful and dangerous forces that build up inside of him and have to be unleashed. And in his case, he's a fire elemental. That's where the title comes from. And it basically follows him trying to avoid capturing, get himself into circumstances where he isn't going to have to be afraid of having his own ability to live free restricted and that he also won't be a danger to other people. So that's that's the short version as far as the world in general goes. There is, sorry, I almost said steampunk. It's not. It's electropunk style technology. So there is, it is um, not quite the medieval template that a lot of high fantasy goes for. And there is very much a divide between the technological uh, world of the humans and the very chaotic magic of the fae who live in the in the forests. So what is the draw to high fantasy then? I know obviously Tolkien and all that other stuff when it comes to the epitome of true fantasy. But why did you want to go with this high fantasy route? Well, partly just because it's very freeing. It gets you out of uh, out of a lot of the research obligations of setting things in, in anything vaguely resembling the real world because you can mm -hmm. shrug and go, that's just how it works here. So <laughs> having to do the research on things like the style of technology that I did, like, okay, would this actually work? It doesn't matter. It works here. <laughs> in some ways, it's kind of a cheat to go high fantasies. In other ways, it's not because you have to make up everything and account for everything that you talk about. But it gives you a lot more freedom in terms of how you're going to go about uh, tackling all that stuff. And I've always just enjoyed settings that feel, I'm I'm going to use a term more usually used with sci-fi, but that feel just a little bit alien. You know, I like something that 
okay, I recognize a lot of things in here, but there's other stuff going on. It's like, what? And for me, at least high fantasy and more completely created settings lend itself to what I like about those things a bit more. You obviously have a, a wide range of characters here, and I, I love the the fey aspect and all that other stuff. But what did you draw from to create these characters? <sighs> that is a question that I'm not even entirely sure how to answer because I've been working on this book for so damn long. I cannot reverse engineer and backtrack the thought process on a lot of this. At the time I started writing it, the, the lead character, Ferris, was... Not quite a self-insert, but was inspired by myself because I was in college when I started working on this thing. So I was myself still in my teens. And at this point, I'm going to be 40 next year. So like I said, working on it for a long time. A lot of the characters uh, initially sort of came out of narrative necessity, sort of figuring out the settings that I wanted and where I wanted the story to go. Like, okay, what characters am I going to need to tell this story? And sort of using that as a starting point. Uh, there were really only, I think, two other characters, primary characters that were born out of something other than necessity, who I you know, were just uh, a contrasting pair of, uh, of personalities that I, I really liked the idea of having them both in there. But pretty much all the rest of them, it's like, okay, well, I need somebody to be this thing for this scene. So creating that character. And that's the kind of thing where revision is really important because the first time you do a pass on that, they're a bit of a blank slate feeling, just fulfilling a narrative purpose, but then going back and, and filling that in a bit more. And actually probably doing it a little bit more than I needed to. I think there's probably more named characters than is necessary, but I, I liked I liked giving names to characters who only had one or two appearances because it makes the world feel like it's populated with people and not functions. Well, it's good to have that. I mean, it shows that you fleshed out a world that you've, you've built from the, literally the ground up. I mean, you are the god of the world, so to speak, and you know you are its creator. So do whatever you like. <laughs> that's that's what's, what's wonderful about that. Looking at all of the characters that you've created, though, did you have any any moral quandaries or ethics you had to, to kind of struggle through to create what you've created? Not especially because it's, it's, not, it, it's not a story dealing with a ton of grand scale themes. I'm, I mean, like there are themes in it there and there are certainly, you know, elements of, of my life and my perspective on the world that influence the story and the way it goes. But I wasn't trying to make a grand point. So the, the degree to which uh, ethics play in it was really kind of started and ended with figuring out where characters' positions on certain things within the world were so that I knew how they would respond to what was going on. But that was, that's all about the specific characters. I didn't have an overarching message or ethical or philosophical point that I was trying to make. Um, as I said, there were themes that came up in the course of writing it, which is kind of my preferred approach to those kinds of things. I, I feel like a lot of times it's it, it's difficult to explain how, but I, I've frequently felt at, at points where I've taken in a certain piece of meaning, I've gone, you started from the basis of, I want to do a story about this theme or making this big point, and then tried to find, and then tried to build a story that would make that point. And I feel like I can almost always tell when that happens. And I'm much more partial to something where like, I just wanted to tell a cool story and here were the themes that got woven into it as it was created. What were some of the themes that, that really stuck out to you once you finally finished the book? Well, um, the, it, it ended up having uh, a bit more of a, uh, of a trans allegory than I would have uh, initially intended because I, uh, I'm gender fluid for anyone who didn't know. Um, and I've been on, on various hormone regimens for about five years. It's honestly a little bit like the X-Men with the way elementalism manifests in these characters. It hits yeah, around late puberty to early twenties, which is the point in life. A lot of trans people have their own sort of realizations or at least start questioning these things about themselves. It's something that they cannot control. It confuses and angers and scares other people around them. There are people who want to just lock them up. There are people who want to quote unquote study them. And that has its own nefarious implications behind it. And that was something that I did not set out to do, <laughs> but as I worked on it over years, my experiences as a, as a queer person definitely seeped into it. 
and I, I suppose there's a bit of a technology versus nature. I would call that a motif, not a theme, because it's not something that I super delve into. It's just a fact of the world. And this is just the way this place is. There are different, I hesitate to say that the Fae have a civilization, but there's definitely different worlds that do not <laughs> mix well. And that's kind of the whole thing with the elementals is they are humans who have a power within them that is closer to something from the Fae. And so they are very much caught between two worlds. And the question is, is there a place for them in either one? Now that you finally finished the book, though, the editing process must have been a real pain in the ass. But uh, what did you edit out of the book? The main thing that came out was I reduced the number of perspectives in it. Mm -hmm. um, my first completed draft, there were, I think there were three <laughs> characters who had chapters that were from their perspective. I mean, this isn't first person, but like followed them um, separate from the lead character or the primary antagonist. It lent it to honestly a bit too much of an ensemble feel. And I was, I realized I was kind of losing the thread of Ferris's story being the primary focus. It probably didn't help that at that point, when I finished the first draft, Ferris was probably the character I was the least interested in. So <laughs> oh, I, I needed to work on that. Trimming down the number of perspectives, which did result in me losing some material that I really loved. But I'm like, I can't, like, th this needs to focus up. And I can't really, for the sake of the story, justify this being here. So ultimately, as it stands, there are basically three perspective characters. There's Ferris and there are two antagonistic characters um, who I had to follow because since paths don't cross between them and Ferris for a while, I had to establish them somehow prior to when they actually actively enter his story. So that's the reason that there is any perspective other than his, but I stripped out everybody else. Not stripped out the characters, but took away any any chapter that was from a perspective that I couldn't justify by those other three characters, by their presence. I always find writing interesting. I always find the minds of authors interesting because it, it, it's amazing to see a single grain, a single storyline, or a, maybe a sentence that starts your, your story off. And in this case, uh, it's an amazing read. What was the funnest scene for you to write and which was the hardest scene for you to write? Action scenes are hard for me, um, partly because I'm nitpicky about them. And I want to be sure that the geography of the of the action and the fight makes sense. Part of this comes from the fact that as much as I do enjoy writing, books are not the primary means of entertainment that I take in. I mostly watch movies and TV. So in my mind, like I have to account for this. And my first pass at action scenes is overwritten and over specific and I'm detailing way more than I have to in terms of like whose hand is where at what point and where in the room they are and where the, like I overdo it finding that balance for action scenes and for fights uh takes takes a bit of work for me anytime I write dialogue you know an active conversation back and forth that is my favorite thing to write and it's usually the first thing that I write part of what stalled me for so long on starting to actually write this is because sort of the way my brain works, I, I zero in on dialogue scenes. Hmm. So the way the story existed in my head before I actually wrote the first draft was, okay, and then this conversation between these two characters, and I actually written that conversation. Here's this conversation, and then, you know, some stuff happens. Then there's this conversation, then some stuff happens. And because my brain kind of glossed over the stuff between conversations. I didn't think the idea that I had would fill a novel until I actually wrote it and realized, oh, there's a lot that goes on in between these dialogue scenes that I was so happy with. Okay, yeah, it did turn out book length when I honestly thought I was going to end up with a novella. Dialogue flows very naturally for me and is is easily my favorite thing to write. Speaking of, of dialogue and, and the language itself of not only of your book, but of the world that we live in, what was the first time that you learned that language had power? Oh, God. <laughs> I'm not even sure I know how to answer that. I mean, I'm not sure that I, I necessarily have learned it in the context of my own work, because I, I don't think I'm able to be that reflective on my own work without being critical to the point of it just being a bad idea for me to do that. 
I will say, though, there's definitely some stuff that I've read, especially in the last few years, that the real amazing thing about it isn't just the story it's telling, but the way that it's written. And I think the first time the importance of that hit me was after I watched, this was when it first came out in theaters, the movie version of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, because those are my favorite books, and I didn't like the movie. And there are a lot of reasons for that, but... What I realized one of them was it lost the narrative voice of Douglas Adams because it's not just the things that happen. It's the words he would use to describe them. And that's where especially a lot of the comedy came from. Some of it was just inherently wacky, but other times he'd describe a mundane scene in a way that still made me laugh. And I think that was probably the first time, at least as a as a reader, that I started to appreciate how the actual writing ability of someone is able to elevate the story. I tend to focus on the narrative more than the craft in my own head, but I do I do appreciate the power of, of being able to do that well. Is this your first time writing in general, or have you tried other projects in the past that have never come to fruition? So, well, it's definitely not my first time writing. Um, it's not my first published work either. It is my first published novel, though. So previous to this, I'd written I'd written and self-published two things um, under the name Vera Wild, Wild spelled W-Y-L-D-E, for anyone who wants to look that up. Uh, the first one was called Skirting Gender, and that that is about my experiences as a gender-fluid person, sort of my journey in that, as well as a little bit of practical advice and my general thoughts on just existing as, as a form of trans person. So that was the first thing that I had published. I think that was 2018. I had that, I published that. A year or two later, I self-published actually a play, a two-act play. The reason I published that was because uh, even though I have inroads with like some local community theaters and whatnot in my area, uh, they were never going to touch the material. And so I'm like, I just to have this off my plate and stop thinking about it, I need to put it out there in some form. So it's, it's self-published on Amazon. You can buy it. And that is called When She Wakes, a BDSM exploration in two acts, which should tell you why I didn't think uh, I'd get anybody to perform it around where I live. <laughs> Sounds interesting. <laughs> I, I'm still quite proud of that piece. In addition to that, I've written like I have a number of finished short stories, um, which I've submitted to a number of places. Nobody ever took them. Um, I had a I had a ten minute play um, that got uh, taken into a festival four years ago or so. That was a while back. And even when I was writing this book, I have other books that I've started and are already in process. While I was doing the editing on this, I have a follow up. Well, I call it a follow up. I, I'd say I have another book set in the same world as Dreams of Fire that is 80% done in terms of a first draft. That's not what I'm trying to work on most right now, but that there's that. This almost felt like a personal challenge because I, I kind of have I kind of have a major bone to pick with uh, with romantic stories, especially romantic subplots. And so I'm actually working on a romance <laughs> novel almost as like a challenge. Can I write something I wouldn't hate? So that's being worked on. I had started work a while ago on what I envisioned as a narrative podcast. I don't know if I'll ever pull the trigger on that or if I do in what format, because that has changed multiple times. I originally thought it was going to be a web series. And then I thought it was going to be a novel. And now I'm looking at, and then I looked at the narrowed podcast. Plus, so I don't even know what's going to happen with that. I have ADHD. So I always have multiple <laughs> things going at the same time. Uh, that's, that's very standard for me. Oh, I was going to ask then how many unpublished works that you have, but it sounds like you have quite a few. Oh dear God. I have no idea. <laughs> In terms of like finish, I would, or have, tried to submit to publishers of some form. There's probably, I don't know, five or six. And then there's probably a dozen in various forms of completion. As a continuous content creator and creative person that you are, what energizes you about the creative process and what drains you? What drains me is getting out of the habit, which uh, is actually something I'm dealing with right now. When I can keep up with working on it, if not every day, at least three or four times a week, on a regular basis, builds the habit and keeps kind of the creative muscles fresh. And getting back into that habit after falling out of it is tricky. Trying to keep up a schedule of YouTube videos at the same time is one of the reasons why I can fall out of the habit. As far as what inspires me, I honestly, I think it's just my own pigheadedness. 
it's not like if I don't work on something for a while that the ideas leave my head. They're still there eating up space. So like, it's kind of just my own need to like get this out so I can stop thinking about it. <laughs> Probably more than anything is what drives a lot of what I do. And that's actually how the YouTube channel started because it started out as a series of scripted shorts that I didn't think would go anywhere. And they kind of didn't in and of themselves, but I'd been thinking about them for a while. I'm like, I just need to do this so that it's off my brain and I can focus on something else. That's kind of the entire basis of my career in quotes. <laughs> but it's not a bad thing to do. I mean, it's, it's a popular channel. You have a lot of people going to it. it you know, you're, you're showcasing a wonderful side of geek culture as well too, with, with well thought out opinions and well thought out pieces of video content. So, you know, you're obviously doing something really well. Oh, so, you know, keep it, keep at it. Don't get so. me wrong. I love what I do. I absolutely <laughs> love what I do. I'm not even really worried about burnout, which I know a lot of YouTubers get because I've, I've been very careful not to be an algorithm chaser and to only talk about stuff that I want to, to some degree. It's pretty uncommon for me to talk about something out of a sense of obligation. I'm not going to say it never happens, but it does not happen often. I absolutely love what I do, but juggling that and everything else is sort of, it's my brain in a nutshell. I have 20 things going on in here, but one of them has to be done by tomorrow at noon. So that's the one that gets worked on right now. And for someone whose brain can't focus on one thing at a time, I suck at multitasking. So... <laughs> It's a juggle. I was going to say struggle, but that's that's probably an overstating it. Well, it's it's interesting, you know. For for myself, I, this is the first time in I think twelve years that I've had a buffer. So you know, it's always wonderful to to have that on YouTube. But um, but it's always interesting to to hear the how other content creators, how other creators themselves, I should say, handle their own well struggles and content and all that other stuff. So. At least I'm not the only one. Oh, see, the thing is, even when I have a buffer, um, my brain tells me I need a bigger one. So <laughs> I still don't relax. And then like something will happen that I'm like, well, oh, crap, I have to talk. That actually happened this, <laughs> this past week because at, at the time of recording this past Saturday, I had a video up and scheduled to premiere and ready to go. And then the news about Russell T. Davis coming back to Doctor Who happened. I'm like, well, I can't. I literally cannot talk about anything else if I haven't talked about this yet. So that got pushed back and I had to do a quick turnaround on, on that video. So like that happens. Plus, you know, my brain keeps telling me the buffer should be bigger. And sometimes even when I take advantage of the buffer, I do so in a way that gets rid of it because I start working on a project that takes me several weeks instead of one week to do. And so then by the time I'm done with that, the buffer has gone again. What has been the fan response and reaction to to your series so far? It's it's been really positive, which has been which has been wonderful. It I just wanted to get this out there and I wanted people to engage with it and enjoy it. And while, you know, it's hardly a bestseller, it never will be. I'm not actually very good <laughs> at self-promotion. I'd be the first to tell you that. But the response has been wonderful and very supportive because even reviews or whatever on things like Goodreads that are a little bit more critical are still optimistic in terms of accepting the fact that this is my first novel and still saying they want to see more from me. And it's been incredibly encouraging. And <laughs> just, okay, slight tangent on this. There, there was one review that I love because it makes an assumption about the book that is incredibly wrong, but the fact that he made that assumption kind of means I succeeded in one of the things I was trying to do. So there was a review, like the entire premise of his review seemed to be based on the assumption that this book is intended to be a prequel to something else that's like set up for later stuff. It's not. Um, like I said, I, I have another book set in the same world, but it has literally one crossover character and that's a cameo. I'm not going to say I'm, I'll never pick up with Ferris again, but I don't plan to. I have no grand ideas that this was a setup for. But the fact that he made that assumption kind of means I succeeded in one of my core philosophies in approaching this. And I said I didn't have philosophies. I meant that in terms of message. Creative philosophies, which is I love small stories in a big world. I love something that feels like the whole world is this fully formed, crafted thing. 
but then doesn't feel the need to tell a story scaled up big enough to justify the size of the world. Like I love Lord of the Rings. I love my epic stuff, but there's something that really hits me about something with this massive world where the story is just this little thing. It's just this little thing about people. So the fact that he assumed that this was a prequel meant that I got the scale right in terms of what I had, what I wanted it to feel like. At what point are we good enough? Wherever you are now has to be good enough. Because you, you will never move forward otherwise. For all your goals to get better at whatever it is, whether it is your work, things about yourself physically or your mental outlook at the world, even if your goal is to improve any or all of those things, right now you still have to be good enough for today. At this step in wherever you're headed has to be where you're supposed to be right now. Because if the entire way that you approach things is I'm not good enough yet, you never will be. The way I kind of think about things for myself with that kind of question is I am good enough for today. And tomorrow I can be better, but today this is as good as I can be. And tomorrow's another day, and we'll see if we can take it further on that day. And then tomorrow, whatever it is, even if it's a backslide, it'll still be good enough because that's today, and we work on it again tomorrow. What did your life change for the better? Whew. <laughs> Repeatedly. I mean, the most recent thing was honestly getting fired from my day job. I'm not going to say that was the best thing that ever happened to me, but it was definitely probably the best thing to happen to me in like the last four years because losing that job and putting it out there and getting a bump in the Patreon support and making a leap and getting caught by the people who liked what I do is what makes this my job now, which like I said, I love what I do. And I was at, I was at an office job for, nine years, nine and a half that I hated. I never liked it, but by the time I, by the time they got rid of me, I absolutely loathed that job. I hated going to work every day that I had to go in. And that's five days a week out of my life. And I absolutely hated it. And losing that job made every, literally just about everything better because I'll plug the Patreon in advance, Council of Geeks on Patreon. I could always use more support it would help. Things are tight. But you know what? I will take the financial stress of getting the bills paid on time over the daily stress of going into a job that I hate every time. <laughs> so that was definitely the best thing to happen to me uh, in a while. But there's also, you know, other stuff that being accepted at coming out to, at the various points that I had to come out to people. So being accepted on the YouTube channel by my family, by my friends. My kid being born, you know, I, th there's been a lot, but the, the job thing was the most recent. What is one mistake that you'll never do again? I've had too many points in my life where I know I said, I'll definitely never do that again. And then did. I'm old enough to go, well, I hope I never do that again. And I hope I'm never in a place where it, I, I get to the point where I would do that again. But I, I don't make promises to myself or to anybody that I will definitely never make a a mistake that I've made again, that that'll definitely never happen again. Cause I've fucked that up too many times <laughs> to assume truth in that. I think it's actually healthier for me because I feel like saying it as a certainty, well, that'll definitely never happen again. Makes it an all or nothing thing. It makes it a matter of, well, if you even start to go that way, well, oh crap, well, it's happened. I'll just lean into it. I feel like having flexibility and understanding your own limits makes it easier to pull back from a mistake instead of doubling down into it. What's the wisest thing that you have heard someone say to you that has stuck with you in your life? <laughs> I, oh, you're asking somebody with ADD who does not have a great memory <laughs> for exact things. You see, I wish I could, I could tell you something that comes from a personal life. Well, okay, you know what? Here's, here's what I'll go with. And this is going to be small, but it's, it's what's coming to mind. My grandfather, who passed away a few years ago, and towards the end of his life, you know, things weren't great. And he knew that. 
But I remember it was probably about a, oh, six months to a year before he passed. Um, I was visiting him and my grandmother and, you know, we caught up a little bit. And, you know, I did that, I think both of us knowing that he wasn't going to remember anything that I told him. But then when I went to leave, he just sort of sat back and he said, hey, keep smiling. Which was something he frequently said uh, as a as a farewell. But I something about that, I stepped out of the house, I closed the door behind me and I I did smile and it wasn't forced. It felt very genuine to just to know everything that was going on and everything that had gone on with him, that that was just his outlook. Like, hey, just keep smiling because you know what? In a bizarre way, it helps. And maybe that means you need to find something to smile about. But however you come to that, it's... It's a small thing, but it's it's one of the it's it's one of the last strong memories I have about him, but it's also one of the lasting ones. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? It's been a lot of people. I mean, more than anything, it's probably been my mother. She has always been there. She has not always been happy with directions my life has taken but she has always been there and always been caring and if i were to pick out one person i think it, it, it would have to be her from a professional standpoint you have a successful youtube channel you are a, an author you have written many other works as well too and you are professionally successful in that route do you consider yourself personally successful yeah yeah, I really do. I the the friends that I have, the positive relationships I have in my life mean the world to me. I have an amazing kid. I have a wonderful partner and things in general have you know, there are down days, there always are, but things in general have felt really good for a while now and yeah, I I don't feel like I have had to give up day-to-day -day happiness in order to have the professional success that I have. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Move the hell on. <laughs> <laughs> like it's frustrating it always will be and like especially something you've sunk a lot of time into because like I, I, I'm, I, this will be far from the first time I pointed this out, but most of the videos on my channel that I've put the most time and the most work in and thought about the longest and were the most complicated to edit, um, get the least views pretty much every time and stuff that I throw together uh, the day before because something topical happened and I have to get a hot takeout do way better. And while that is frustrating for me, I move on from it because I still enjoy making those more complicated things that are longer edits because I wanted to do that. So did it succeed in a way reflective of the work put into it? No. So what? Next thing. The younger generation is looking at your work and you do have the younger generation with you as well. And they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a content creator, whether it's as an author, or whether it's as a creative person with however they'd like to be creative. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Find what kicks your own creative energies and just roll with it. I don't think there's much use in trying to be inspiring. Like most of the people that I've drawn inspiration from, they weren't trying to be that for me, but they were just by being and existing and being who they were in the way that they chose to live. And at least in my experience, what gets people inspired and energized is people being passionate about what they do, what they make, what they say. And so if you can bring that energy, somebody who connects with either the platform you're using, the medium or the things you're saying will find it and get inspired by it just by the love that you put into it, which like I say, is why I don't chase algorithms. 
Uh, I'm not going to say I'm completely immune to them, but whenever I hear about creators burning out, it's almost always because they build what they do around what they think will catch traction more than around what they really want to be doing. And you can, you can tell when the passion is there versus when this is something I just need to do. Well, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. But before I let you go, how can we support you on social media and, of course, Patreon and any, anything else you'd like to help promote? So I mentioned the Patreon already. There are two main things to look for. The first is Council of Geeks, um, under which you will find the YouTube Twitter, a uh, Twitch channel, which I stream currently on Wednesdays, also on Instagram, though I don't use that one very much. There's also a subsidiary channel, Break Room of Geeks. Council of Geeks is where I put up my more polished stuff, um, whereas Break Room of Geeks is less scripted, less edited, and is usually just rambling reviews about whatever I've seen lately. You can also look up, as I mentioned previously, Vera Wild, Wild again spelled W Y L D E. And under that, focus much more on my experiences as a gender fluid person uh, exclusively because I do talk about that a little bit on Council of Geeks, but usually in terms of how it informs my opinion on media. Um, for a more flat out conversation about that, you can find Vera Wild on YouTube and Twitter uh, and Instagram and TikTok as well. Um, there's a few other things. There's the Council of Geeks um, podcast, which is currently host to What the Frell, where uh, Jesse Gender and I are watching every episode of Farscape. Me as a longtime fan her as a first time viewer where uh we've started uh season four of that recently um and i'm also on a bi-weekly dungeons and dragons um stream on twitch that's on partridge quill the campaign is called quill and sword so you can look that up as well um as far as my published works all available on Amazon, Dreams of Fire, published under Nathaniel Wayne, Skirting Gender, and When She Wakes, published under Vera Wilde. Um, and in the case of both Skirting Gender and Dreams of Fire, those are also available through Ingram, which means they can be acquired by your local bookstore or library if you don't feel like making Jeff Bezos richer. So, got <laughs> options. That is probably one of the most complete social media platform promotions that I've had in 12 years. So I, I, I have to do it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> at, at, the, at the end of every podcast, Jesse and I run through our stuff. So yeah, I've, I've gotten used to covering a lot in as condensed amount of time as I can. I did it all in one breath once. Yeah. Well, that's impressive. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, you've done amazing work. I can't wait to keep following you in your future endeavors. I'd love to have you back on the show, talk more about either whatever you'd like to, whatever you're going to create in the future. I'd love to have you back on. So I, uh, Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks so much. As I said, that this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk, you can, of course, find this interview and thousands of others on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media and our website, tgtmedia.com or two geeks talking docs. Dot com. That's the word two, not the number two. I'm going to have to totally edit this completely again. <laughs> And as I say every week, everyone has a storage talent up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.